Okay, so let's pick back, let's pick up on the diversity again. Uh, you'll notice by watching this video of uh, the Tim Hortons of Mark Wafer. So Mark Wafer, who was supposed to be at McEwen uh, this summer, but unfortunately due to, uh, due to COVID, he wasn't able to come out here. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, as an instructor, I went out on a limb and I told my students, I said, if you can get Mark Wafer to come to my class and give a guest lecture, I'll give you an A plus in the course. And of course, I had a couple students who took me up on that and uh, they were, they discovered the miracle of university bureaucracy and institutional inertia. And uh, they ran into numerous obstacles and so they actually ended up going through the city of Edmonton and arranged it so that Mark Wafer would be coming here to give a talk. But unfortunately due to, due to COVID, uh, you know, he wasn't able to come out. Of course, these students were such keeners that they would get an A plus anyway, so it really wasn't much of a, you know, it wasn't really much like a much of a gamble on my part, right? <laughs> uh, Mark Wafer, so you'll notice from the video uh, that he had a problem with hiring. And one of the things about hiring for a 7-Eleven or a McDonald's is it costs a lot to hire a new employee. To hire a new employee, uh, to bring them up to speed, you know, it's around $5,000, four or $5,000. You think about the time it takes to go through the applications, to interview someone, and then to train that person. That's a, that's a lot. And in, the, and in the industry, the fast food industry, you know, the turnover is around 80%, 80 to 100%. A couple things are really interesting about my, what Mark Wafer did. First of all, he went on on a limb and hired Clint, right? Uh, Clint with Down syndrome is actually a better worker for that type of a job than someone without Down syndrome because people with Down syndrome tend to be very good at repetitive tasks and also tend to be very detail oriented. Someone like myself would really suck at that job because I'd be wanting to talk to everybody, right? And I'd be like, hey, what's going on? You know, and I would probably, I would mix up the orders. I would forget orders, of course. Mark Wafer hits upon this idea of hiring people with disabilities because the other thing about people with disabilities is they have some of the highest levels of education and, and training of the population. We feel sorry for them, so we you know, send them to university, give them an education, but then no one will hire them. And so we have a group of highly skilled people that aren't being hired because there's this perception that they can't do the job or that it'll be awkward. Mark Wafer now has uh, 42 people with disabilities working for him. And as he says in the video, in 2011, he had less than one hour of sick time from that group of people. That's right, what, less than one hour of sick time. Let's compare that for a moment with Alberta Health Services. Now, I realize Alberta Health Services is a much larger organization. Yeah, of course, right? Last year, Alberta Health Services had, I believe, $180 million in sick time. That's right, $180 million. When you have people that aren't happy at their jobs, right? You look at the spat going on between the doctors and the province. Look. Anytime the management says to an employee, you know what, we're cutting your wages or we don't value you, the employees have ways of making it back, right? They will slow down. 80% of workers are disengaged, which is to say 80% of people do not want to be at their jobs. When they don't want to be at their jobs, they're not, they're not going to try very hard and they're going to give you their minimal effort, nothing extra. They're going to slow down. So you pay them less, their breaks get longer, they work, they work not as hard, they take longer breaks, they will miss things. You'll also get something called at Starbucks, the green light special. The green light special is when you have workers who say, oh, what was that order? I will very kindly give that person the exact opposite. So someone walks in and asks for a decaf, non-fat, extra hot mocha, well, I'm going to give them the full, de the full caffeinated with an extra shot of caffeine. I'm going to make sure I load up the fat, and then I'll give them their order. And they'll say, oh, I can't believe it's not fat. It's so good. Yeah, I know. Sip it, sweetie. So those type of things happen in organizations all the time. You get people who are there, but they're actually not there. And in organizations, that's around 80%. So thinking that, you know, we can just tell people, give this money and get this result, yeah, right. That's, that's not the case at all. Mark Wafer has employees like Clint 
who not only do not phone in sick, but also are giving it 100% on the job. And notice in that, uh, when, they, when they switch there to Walgreens and they talk about how they have the instructions that you can work at um, aisle 43 or hippopotamus. Well, yeah, you know, that means that if I didn't hear 43, I can also remember hippopotamus and I go to that aisle because that's where I'm working. It's something that makes it better for everyone. And this is really what uh, disabilities uh, is showing us. And as Rich Donovan points out, those, there is a tremendous return on, return on uh, disability for people, for companies that are embracing diversity. And pity those companies that aren't. Because not only does it give you access to this market, but it gives you a different lens to see your operations. And instead, you know, by comparison, think about the staffing of Tim, Tim Hortons in Fort McMurray a couple of years ago, right? There was such a demand, we didn't have people, so what did we do? We went to the Philippines and had temporary worker permits to bring in workers from out of country. Really, we could have used workers right here if we had been willing to take the risk and, and, and hire people with disabilities. And as Mark Wafer shows us, there is a tremendous advantage to doing that. Another group that we tend to not think of is the elderly. So you can, you've, you've already hopefully watched this. If you haven't, just pause the video and watch, but take a look at Vita Needle. So Vita Needle is a needle make manufacturer in Needham, Massachusetts and they make needles, and the average employee is 76 years old. And you'll see Rosa Finnegan, who is 100 years old, who is there making needles, right? This is extraordinary. And I'm going to play a clip now of the one part of the clip that, so first of all, notice how they have tapped into a workforce, which gives them a competitive advantage over their, over their competitors. The second thing I want to point out is just look, Managing this organization or these people is very different than a, you know, than your typical company. So take a look at uh, at this part. It's uh, it's at about the five minute mark. Okay. Oh. New chairs. Uh, new chairs. Right. They're going to get a different kind of a chair for yeah. me. Camaraderie and flexibility are obvious reasons older folks like it here. They're writing songs of love, but not for me. <laughs> but another reason is being of use. Is work at this age then redemptive? Yes, says Katrin Lynch. So why am I showing you this? Okay, let me just scroll back a little bit and bring your attention to what I'm showing you here. So they've got new chairs, right? Oh, new chairs, oh, wow, this is wonderful. We've got new chairs. And you're thinking, okay, this is, this is great. The, the, the people got some chairs. Notice how this shows us a critical difference between this generation and my generation and certainly your generation, okay? So I'm just gonna walk over to the whiteboard because I wanna sketch this out for you. And what we are seeing here in the Vita Needle is really a great example of what we would call the traditional organizational structure. So in the traditional organizational structure, we have management in the top, right? The eye in the sky that doesn't blink. And then we have our workers down here, right? And if they have a problem or a question, right? Any problem, any question, uh, that will go up up the ranks here of the organization until it reaches somebody who can give a, give a, re a response, right? So yeah, I, I don't know what to do exactly with this question. Uh, I'll see what the boss says. And then up it goes until finally it hits somebody who has the answer and then the answer comes back down to these people, okay? So for example, one of the really cool company that I like is Zappos, which is run by Tony Zay. And Zappos is a sh online shoe company, and their thing is we will is customer service. They will provide the best customer service in the world, and you have one year to return to return the shoes. So you can get some really sweet kicks, like this, from there, and they will deliver them to your house. Amazing service, okay? A, guy, uh, a guy's wife is sick, and so she's in the hospital, and he says, you know what, Mom, I'm going to buy you a pair of shoes, because uh, she doesn't have any good shoes. She says, you know, I can never get a good pair that fits me. says, you know what, Mom, I'm going to buy them at Zappos. I'll get three 
pairs of the same shoes, an eight, eight and a half, and a nine. We'll see which one fits you best. Whichever ones don't fit you, we'll send them back and we'll keep the ones that fit. Okay, she says, that's, that's great. He orders the shoes. Mom gets sick, she goes to the hospital. She comes home, she's back in the hospital. This goes on for a while and un unfortunately she passes away. And so she dies and then uh, him and his brother are there and, and they're cleaning out the house and they come across these three pairs of shoes. And he's like, oh my gosh, we still got these three pairs of shoes here. I totally forgot about these. I wonder what we should do with these. So he picks up the phone and he calls Zappos and he says, hey, I, I ordered three pairs of shoes from your company uh, and I know you've got like a one year return thing and it's, it's been a little bit longer than a year and I'm wondering what I should do with the shoes. So imagine that you were in that person's uh, seat. What would you do? You know, my, my favorite student response ever in the history of 316 was one student who looked at me and said, how do you know she's really dead? And I'm like, what, you want to cut her toe off and send it in? Like, what the heck are you talking about, man? Uh, in an organization, you wouldn't really know what to do because you think, well, I don't know what the policy is regarding this. Do I, do I give you store credit? Do I say maybe donate them to charity? Do I give you a percentage, right? You don't know what to do, you have a question, and the question goes up here until it receives a solution, and the solution comes back. And so in this instance, this is, takes a long time, right? Zappos has adopted a completely different structure, which is the people on the front lines are, are empowered to be able to, uh, you know, make the decisions right at the point of contact. So in this case, the person on the other side says, you know what, sir, sorry to hear about that. There'll be a truck outside your, outside your house tomorrow morning and we'll, we'll refund you the full amount and we'll take the shoes back. And so next morning, there's a knock at the door. The guy goes there, the guy says, I understand you, you're giving some shoes back. Yeah, he says, I have these three pairs here. So the guy takes the shoes, gives the check, says, I got one more thing for you goes out to the truck, puts the shoes in, and he comes back with a big bouquet of flowers. And the bouquet of flowers has a little note, and it says, Dear Sir, so sorry to hear about the passing of your mother. Please accept these shoes, or please accept these flowers on our behalf, kindly. And it was the name of the person that he had spoken with on the phone. That is outstanding service, and that type of service can really only happen, you know, in this type of a context, because here, you know, it would take like a couple weeks to figure out what our response is to this person who has something that doesn't fit the, the typical situation. Just quickly, this is why business is such a difficult thing to study. Because we could look at Zappos and say, wow, that is amazing and that is what, you know, every company should do. Uh, yes, except this is a strategy that is working for one company at one point in time with one certain set of variables. It may not work somewhere else. It may not work with another company. It may not work with other people. Other companies have had return policies like that and have gone bankrupt because people have returned things that they didn't buy there or that were broken or that were used. Zappos has found a way to make it work. And you know, that has given them a competitive advantage. Trying to mirror that elsewhere is very difficult. Which brings us back to this chair. So why is the chair a big deal? Well, think about it this way. If you had a chair at work that was broken, what would you do? You know, would you just sit there and wait for management to notice that the chair is broken and come fix it? Probably not. You would probably go to your manager and say, hey, my chair is broken, I need a new chair. Or if you work at a university like I do, you just wait till someone leaves an office or something is left unguarded and you go and you take it and you swap it and then, you know, you've got your chair, right? It's, uh, that's how things work here. These people at Zappos though, this generation is a generation that tends to wait for solutions. So they are waiting for the boss to notice that they are throwing their back out because their chair is inadequate. And after, you know, they come to work and look, there's a chair. They didn't ask for it. They were expecting that the boss here would notice there was a problem and then would solve the problem and would deliver the problem to them. They're not proactive. 
It's very different than a situation like here, right? If we swap the employees, you can imagine these people here feeling like they're absolutely handcuffed, and the people here feeling like they're lost in a field where there's no direction. What am I supposed to do, right? What do I do when, the, when this happens? You know, needles are very specific. They have very, uh, cl very uh, close parameters that they have to fit. Whereas something like this, you know, it's, it's, it's very different, right? So the new paradigm in, in business is, is this. How can we create a system where we can have people on the front line that we trust to do the right thing? Okay, I have one more story that I have to tell you. I'll come back to my, my podium. I have one more story that I have to tell you because this is the greatest one of the greatest stories ever. Uh, my parents are part of the Vita Needle generation, right? So they're part of this, the traditionalists. And they are people who have, you know, this belief in authority uh, that someone that is a president or, you know, it must be a nice person and must be doing the right thing. And they're also a generation that has this profound belief in the goodness of people. I call my mom every day. Every day I, I call her, how you doing, mom, right? So I call her one day and I said, Mom, how you doing? She says, well, we had a little excitement here. They live in northern BC on a small acreage uh, about two hours south of Prince George, out in the country of a little place called McBride where I grew up. And uh, so I'm thinking, oh boy, maybe the, you know, maybe the cows got out and ate the, ate the carrots or something, or maybe they went to town and there was no butter. You know, there's the, all these things could be exciting. I said, well, wh what happened? She said, well, we had two guys that came to our house yesterday, and they said, yeah, we, uh, our trucks broke down, and we really need to go to Valmont. Valmont's about 45 minutes away. We need to go to Valmont. Uh, we, we, we're meeting a girlfriend out there. And uh, my mom said, well, she said, you boys must be hungry. Come into the house, and I'll get you something to eat. Because this is what my mom does. She gives you food, right? If she likes, she just gives you food. They said, well, we're kind of in a hurry. We, we, we're just wondering if you could give us a ride there. Well, mom says, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to dad and see what, see, what, see what grandpa says about this. So grandpa, he notices that there's something going on. He's come to the house and he says, what's, what's going on, boys? They said, well, our, our vehicles broke down and we need to go to Valmont. Dad says, well, you know what, boys? Because uh, these are people from, who have lived through the 30s. So they're, you know, everything, you never... You never go to an expert for help, you fix it yourself. So my dad says, well, I can fix it. I've got tools here, I'll come to your truck, I'll fix your truck for you. Well, that's okay, you know, we're, we got a friend who's gonna come pick the truck up and we just really wanna get to Valmont. We're kind of in a hurry actually to get there because uh, you know, his girlfriend is waiting for us there and we just really wanna get there. Well, dad says, sure, we can do that. Uh, you know what, we'll, t we'll take the van and, and we'll go. Mom says, I'll, I'll make some food for you for the trip, of course, right? 45 minutes is a long way. We've got to have food for this trip. So they get the van, and uh, the van is a minivan that I gave them because it was, we didn't need it anymore. They took the middle seats out so they can put potatoes in there to take to town and eggs, which they sell to the, to the locals. So these two guys sit in the back of the van. It's got tinted windows on the back, and they're sitting back there. My parents are in the front, and they start driving down the road. To, to Valmont, and the first thing they notice is there's an airplane in the air. Well, it's a police airplane. Well, Dad says, look at that, a police airplane. Oh, that's interesting. Police car goes sailing by them, and Mom says, well, there goes a police car. Look at that, it must be Pete. I wonder where Pete the Heat's off to. He's the local police officer there. Uh, they're driving along, and another police car goes by. Well, Dad says, all this activity, I wonder what's going on. And my mom says, I bet you it's poachers. We have a terrible problem with poachers, people who hunt illegally here in our valley. There is no problem with poachers. It just means that my mom heard something on the news about poaching and thinks there must be a problem about it. She turns to the boys in the back. The boys are, you know, in their 50s or something like that. She says, you boys, do you have problems where you're from with poachers? Uh, you know, not, not really, they said. Uh, not, not, not so much, no. Um, yeah, I don't think so. So they keep driving along, and uh, pretty soon they, they come to a police barricade. The police have blocked the road, and uh, Pete's there bringing people through traffic, uh, bringing the traffic through, and he sees my dad who's rolled the window down. He says, ah, oh, Mr. Kime, go ahead, go ahead, go through. So dad drives through, and 
you know, they go through, Dad says, boy, that's quite something. These poachers, man, I can't believe they got the road blocked for these poachers. That seems like kind of a big deal. They get to Velmont. Dad said, I've never seen two men so happy to be in Velmont my entire life. He said, these guys were just ecstatic. They were very thankful. We dropped them off. We turned around. They come back through, through the barricade. They, they get back to their house. They go in there and they say, man, that was, that was quite something. And the phone rings. It's, it's the neighbor, uh, Little Ray. So Little Ray has called them and he says, uh, did you hear about the escaped convicts? The police have said these two convicts have escaped from a prison and they're out here and we're not supposed to let anyone into our house. Well, Dad says, that's, that's interesting. We just gave a, a ride to two guys uh, out to Velmont. Well, Ray says, I heard there's a police barricade. Like, the, you should have stopped there. Oh, no, they, we got waved through, and they're, they're in Velmont now. But these were nice guys. Ray says, you should really call the police about this and tell them what you did. Don't, don't you think so? Well, Dad says, you know, I wouldn't want to bother the police because they're, they're quite busy. And, uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll talk to someone. So he hangs up, and he calls Bob Leary, who drives a grader because Bob Leary has a radio in his, uh, a CB in his grader, and hears all the news on the channels, right? So he asks Bob Leary about the convicts. Yeah, Bob says, there's two convicts at large in the valley here. Apparently, police are saying they're dangerous, and we should be locking our houses. Well, oh, that's interesting, Dad says. I, you know, I gave a ride to two guys. So he lets Bob go, and he's sitting there wondering what to do, and the phone rings, and it's the police, and they say, we understand that you've uh, given a ride to two gentlemen uh, out to Valmont, yes, Dad says, and he describes him. Three minutes later, there are two police cars at my parents' house, and they show a picture, and yes, Mom says that's them. They, they looked a little better in, in, you know, in real life, but those are, the, those are the guys we gave a ride to. So then the police tore out of there. My mom says to me, at the end of all of this, she says, you know, I really think we should have got a reward for this. I said, uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. I said, uh, why, why, why is that, Mom? She said, well, we gave the police very good information about where we dropped the criminals off and at what time. I said, Mom, you took two escaped criminals, you uh, gave them food, you put them in your van, and you smuggled them through a police barricade, and you set them free. You know, I don't know that that's necessarily worthy <laughs> of a reward. In sum, this is something that my parents' generation like does. If someone is in need, they stop and they help. This is not something that your generation or even my generation does. And, you know, it's also something that's probably very unlikely to happen in a city. But this older generation, the generation of Vita Needle, this is a generation that is incredibly, you know, caring and kind and where we can find this kind of behavior. It also means, though, that we have to have a very different understanding of employees, of workers, and of how they function in organizations in order to manage them properly. Okay? We'll pick this up again next time.